company because it's unusual. The baseball game. Oh, yeah. All three of us play this. I don't know whether it's everywhere, but that's what I'm uh, uh, Oh, yeah. That's my guess. Nothing about Okay, I'm going to go ahead and start the meeting and I'm going to say thank you. Hopefully, we're going to have some interesting stuff. Number one, there's a couple of things I want to bring up. Uh, tonight is prompt reading competition and it's like what went wrong that's the title of the prompt how many people are going to enter that competition tonight one two one two three four right. okay at this time four hey is your arm up you're not going to enter tonight okay four five okay so we have five people this way enter. okay Tonight is prompt reading. Every other month we have a speaker. So next month is going to be Jack Caldwell, and he puts together groups of authors that kind of mingle and critique each other, and he sets up different programs. But he himself is a historical fiction romance male. It's, it's odd that a male can write romance. That's what his subject is going to be next month. So, but our competition tonight is going to have four of us, I believe, or three of us. And raise your hands again, those that are going to compete in the competition tonight. All right. All right. Melissa. Chris. John. I have who else? Me. Yeah, I got him. I got him first. The public license is operating the camera. Okay, what went wrong? It's going to be Neil, Melissa, Abraham, Chris, and John Francois. I changed your last name. Did you know that? Here we go. Okay, so that right there is going to take place in a few minutes. Okay. We don't have a whole lot of business to share with you because what we're going to be doing in the future is we're going to be having a ebook seminar free to the public, free to our members. The past president, Deborah LeBlanc, is going to be the one giving it. So if you've got stories inside of you that have not been published or if you've got books that you want to go to ebook, She's going to break it down, and you're going to get as much information as you can. Um, the <coughs> South Regional Library is going to be partnering with us and promoting us. So all of this advertisement about the Writers Guild offering this free ebook seminar is going into their calendar of events July coming up next week. They have summer programs, so when they get connected, they help promote. So it's a little early, but we will slightly mention that today. Uh, it's going to be for Saturday, September 2nd, and we're going to be, at that time, asking people to write down who's coming, so it's going to be 30 plus people in that room, and that's about it, so we want to be sure that our members are able to get in there, but they told us not to worry about it. They will pull more chairs or tables if that's what happens, so we're looking forward to that in September. Okay, come October, I don't have any information yet. But I'm letting you know all of this. We'll be kind of talking about it. Definitely want to get information about the Baton Rouge Book Festival. If any of you know anything about that and the dates that it's happening, I know Carrie Simon does, who is not here tonight. Uh, we're going to get that information. And if you choose any book festival to attend, that's the one you need to go to. The Baton Rouge Book Festival, and that's happening in October. And then coming up in uh, September... October, November, we, the Writers Guild of Acadiana, will probably be the ones doing a book festival inside of another festival in Grand Teton, Louisiana, which is uh, out there past Opelousas or whatever, or right before Opelousas. Grand Coteau. How many of you know where Grand Coteau is? It's a little bitty town. Let me tell you what. We've been there, and they want us to set up an author event. Except they have coming, they have traffic that will be there. It's already a festival that happens every year. So that's giving us some promising uh, participation. So as that nears, we'll let you know about that. 
Uh, we'll later on ask for volunteers. If you want to, you know, volunteer to bring a treat or something like that to any of these events, whatever, we, you'll get more information. For those of you who do not know who Deborah LeBlanc is, Deborah LeBlanc writes paranormal mystery stories, and she herself was the past president of the Writers Guild. And so she is really heavy into books now, ebooks and movies. So she's able to give us quite a bit of information there. Um, we're hoping to find out information and have a speaker come in the 2018 lineup of speakers here. We pretty well have all of our speakers for the rest of the month, year, year. year. Audio books. It was brought to our attention at the board meeting to consider getting a speaker from to talk about audio books. You know, and I thought that was a great idea. So if you run across anybody that you know that could tell us or be a part of showing us how to go about doing it, we would like to have that information. So that's what we're going to be working on also. Uh, I see Ann Vincent is not here again tonight. So I'll have to put that down for next month. <laughs> Ann Vincent took out her time to uh, wrap gifts for us, represent the Writers Guild, and put quite a bit of funds back into our, our bank account, which we appreciate. So we wanted to award her with a special name tag that she's going to be wrapping all the Barnes and Nobles gifts. We want Writers Guild of Katie Ann to get the credit. So we had a name tag done for her that says, Writers Guild of Acadiana gift wrapper. So if ever she comes back, we will be taking pictures and uh, you handing her the name tag. Okay, um, we still have cookbooks that you can get for $5, which was our one of our first projects that we did here by the Writers Guild. We still have our anthology books, which if you purchase it here, is $10. Okay, there are specials on uh, Amazon.com and ebook. Uh, and there's something else I was going to bring up too. Book books, anthology books. Okay, I guess that's it. Is there anything I forgot, board members? I don't think so. I think we have all that. Okay. Say that, prompt. The prompt? That's going to be interesting. The August prompt is going to be interesting because you know how August is the hottest month of the year. That's what I believe and I've been told and a lot of people believe it. So our prompt is going to be dog days. We're going to see what kind of stories come up with dog days. That's for the last week of July. August. Uh, and it's poetry. There was, was July. Okay, wait. There's a speaker in July. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, every other month we have a speaker, and she wanted to go ahead and let you know. We thought okay. it was cute. So our speaker is Jack Caldwell. He'll be here next month, and then after that it will be that uh, prompt. When we have a speaker, we don't have a prompt. Okay. And so, therefore, we try to give all our attention. And it'll be poetry. And it will be poetry. It will be poetry. Okay. Alrighty, Vice President, where are you at? Do you have anything to say? Really and truly, we didn't do any voting or anything like that. Is there anything you'd like to add? He's new. He's our new Vice President. No, Okay. And Miss Ellen, is there anything? No. Okay. All right. Okay, then let's start the fun. Prompt competition. And we go row by row, so it means you'll go last. Oh. Sir. Each person will be given a number, and all those who are not reading are going to be elected as or nominated as judges. So you get to vote. So each person will have a number, number one, number two, in that order. And so when you vote, you vote for the number of the person that you like the best. Then we'll pick these up 
and we will see which number gets the most votes. Oh, you're reading. So you're literate. Okay, before we get this started, is there anyone that's here tonight that's never been before? All right, well, welcome. You're visiting us tonight? Or, okay, great. You're, you're I am, I am. Okay, so anyway, what we're going to do is we do the prompt competition where we got our speaker and everybody reads their material. We have a limit of 500 words and usually you have to have it typed, you know, ahead of time what you're going to be competing for the next go round. So it has to be typed, cannot be on digital. It has to be a hard copy given to us once if you win. And then we give it to uh, John Francois. And so from that, uh, we keep a copy. And later on, we will publish it with your permission in a, another anthology book we put together. So we'll do the competition first. Then, new member, new person, your name and where are you from? Suzanne. Right now, we uh, reach our You're from New York. New York. Wow. Welcome to Cajun land. <laughs> All right, interesting. Good food, nice people. Glad that you're here. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to have a competition. Then after that, what brings you here? If you don't mind me asking. To, to Louisiana. No, what brings you to the meeting tonight? Oh, I don't know. I kind of stumbled across it on the internet. And well, why not? But tell she us how. What you stumbled across? Came because she found how did you find us? On what? I'm always looking because I'm a writer and I publish my own books and stuff, and I. I'm always just well, great. Well, thank you. We'd like to know the reason we'd like to know is so that we'll know what areas possibly we can advertise in. And what is your name again? Suzanne. 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 Thank you for attending tonight. We will do a competition, and then everybody that's a paid member is then given five minutes to be able to talk about anything they want to talk about of what they're, they're writing, working on, or have published. And so that way we know what each person is doing. You may end up sitting next to somebody that you may want to talk to afterwards. And a new no here. Or as a no, no longer stays open to 10 o'clock at night. So it, our meeting's over at 30. We visit from 8.30 to almost 9. And they come back here to let us know it's time to leave. So be sure to know that those hours, they're, they're enforcing them. Yes, ma'am? Um, so you don't have to be a member to do this competition? You do. Okay. You do have to be a member to be able to enter. And what it is, is by being a member, okay, it's $25 a year, usually January, okay. and then you have it's a book bag. Online. online is supposed to, what is it? It's $30 for a new member. The first new member. Uh, $25 that's true. for renewal. That's true. That's why. Well, I'll ask you about that, too. Okay, we're halfway through. Do we you prorate by the month, and then they still turn around and pay back in January. Divided by the 12 or whatever's left. Is that the only, like, I think it's $2. $2. Sir? Yeah, it says 30 but you get the $5 bag, right. which is why it's 30 Which is why it's 30 So you, you do get, get a bag, you get a bag, and uh, 25 plus which the bag. Which we will show you an example of here in yeah. a minute. Dig it out. There you go. Okay. So that's what you get as a ASA. $30 to be a member, and you just yes. Nice, uh, uh, empty bag to carry your but the most important thing in. the most important thing is that it enables you to to receive a newsletter be sure your email is correct if you do join and from there you get the newsletter with all the resources and competitions that you may be interested in traveling to or an update on a new author of ours or something we want to brag about what our, our deal has done and so that therefore that's what we like to do. That's what you get. You get discounts on, on shops that we do charge for, which the one in September we're not. So it, it's a bit of resource. It's a great resource. Internet. It's on that we have a web page and all that. So what you don't hear here, you may be able to find out on the internet. And that's another thing too. We still encourage people, paid members especially, 
members of the GAO, we encourage anything that you, you do, please send a note to our webmistress at info. Is that how we're doing it, Julia? Anybody that wants to tell you about something they printed, they published, okay, they can send it to you at info at what is it? Okay, at info. Okay. <laughs> Whatever's on the line. Okay, okay. So we're still accepting uh, information, updates from our members, right? Because a while back, I think you turned around and some of it was so old, you took some off. So that's a good thing. And if you don't know the webpage, it's www.writersguildkadiana.org. Writers Guild of Acadia or Writers Guild of Acadia? That's what I'm thinking. Writers Guild of Acadia. I There's think we no had to do away with the uh. We have to change. Yeah, There's no uh. Yeah, Writers Guild of Acadia. Mm -hmm. Dot org. Well, it comes up. I just took Writers Guild of Acadia. Automatically? Yeah, it just well, took good. Yeah, well, good. Thank you right yeah. there. Oh, good. As long as you get there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Sorry about my phone earlier, waiting to hear from a client, so I had to see if it was the person. Um, I'm, as you can tell, I'm a, I'm a fantasy writer, so I just have to kind of give that out there before you hear the, the characters I'm putting out here. Um, it's called Captured. The elf slowly opened his eyes, but all he could see was a blurry orange glow. He made to wipe away the sleep, but his hand would not move. As the elf blinked, his surroundings became clearer, and his other senses awakened. The orange glow was a fire, not three feet away, and around it slept three tall men, a young woman and a thin boy. The elf himself was standing, bound to the trunk of a tree, with ropes about his shoulders, chest, waist, and knees. He heard a whinny to his right, turned his head, and saw a unicorn colt tied to another tree. In a panic, he looked searchingly all around him until his eyes rested on a long, spiraled horn that lay by the hand of the oldest man. The elf hung his head. There was no more need to look for the mother. What went wrong, Orbogan? he asked himself. He had been so careful, following the unicorn and its cold, watching and listening for any kind of danger. Then out of nowhere, he heard a maiden singing. No sooner had the mother heard this sound than she darted in that direction. Orbogan had turned to follow her, only to feel a thick arm wrap itself around his neck. Something heavy had struck him on the head, and his whole world had gone dark. Now Orbogan could smell the <coughs> dried blood in the matted black hair that had fallen in front of one eye. He groped about his waist, feeling for his dagger, only to find that his weapons had been removed. He struggled against his bonds. He tried to see if he could free his hands, but the ropes were too thick and tightly bound. Sighing, the elf leaned back against the tree, tears flowing down his cheeks, his lips parted, and in a barely audible, in a voice barely louder than a whisper, he sang a dirge, both in apology and lament for the innocent life that he had failed. Orbogan heard a soft rustling of leaves, but he did not look up. Whether the person had turned over in his sleep or was getting up to deliver abuse, it made no difference. He heard the cold whinny, but a voice made anxious, shushing noises. Orbogan turned his head. The young boy was trying to saw through the rope that bound the cold to the tree. Glancing from the sleeping people to the rope with fearful eyes, the child worked quickly, yet quietly, until he had freed the unicorn. Silently trying to shoo the colt away, the boy turned his large eyes toward the elf. In the dancing light, Orbogan could see the child was trembling from his brown hair to his dirty cut feet. Still, the boy took a deep breath and began to saw away at the ropes that held the elf's knees. Orbogan knew he may never understand what had gone so wrong, but at least there was hope that all might not be lost. Wow. The title of my work is a takeoff from Flannery O'Connor's A Good Man is Hard to Find. The title of my piece is A Good Plan is Hard to Find, <laughs> which has nothing to do with my story, <laughs> maybe. Flora planned everything down to the last detail. She scattered the freshly shelled butter beans on the floor, which would add a certain air of domesticity to her death. When Fred came in, he would see her lying there among the scattered beans and conclude she'd had a heart attack. You see, Flora had told her husband before he left for work that morning that the doctor said she had a real bad heart and any kind of excitement could trigger a fatal heart attack. So when Fred would come home from work and finding her dead on the floor, she imagined him shouting gleefully, free at last. Thank God, I'm free at last, and falling to his knees in a parody of matrimonial emancipation. Then once he got back to his feet, 
she further imagined his joy would also manifest itself in the form of an awkward and graceless dance. Whereupon she would sit up and point out with an accusative voice that, see, she knew it, he really wanted her dead. Now Fred had never said he wanted her dead or that he even wanted the divorce because he was not a direct man. He was what psychiatrists would call a perfect example of a passive-aggressive person. At least, that was her thinking of the whole matter. That afternoon, as Flora lay on the floor amid the scattered butter beans, waiting for Fred to come home, she wondered if she looked right. Flora, you see, was a stickler for detail. Having had a heart attack while shelling peas, would she have actually fallen off the couch and onto the floor, or would she have merely slumped over? Would her eyes be open or closed in death? Leaving no details to chance, she got back to her feet and sat on the couch, pretended to have a heart attack, and slumped over. Slumping, she found, hurt her neck, and she was not at all comfortable playing dead in that position. So she got back down on the floor. The beans were already there, so why waste that scenario? Now, should she be lying on the side or on her back? She tried her side, but that hurt her hip. So being on her back was decidedly more comfortable. I mean, if you're going to be dead, why not be comfortable? <laughs> Further, she wondered, being on her back and all, should her legs be modestly together with toes pointed deeply in the air? Or should her legs be ungracefully splayed with feet flopping outward? While being dead could be comfortable, death did not necessarily mean being pretty. So casting modesty aside, she spread her legs and splayed her feet. Next, she tried a few faces, reflecting pain and surprise, but found it was hard to keep that expression for any length of time. So she relaxed her face decided that her eyes would be closed in death and began practicing breathing in the most shallow manner possible. Just then she heard someone at the door. She did not lift her head to confirm to see if it was Fred because if it was he and he saw her move it would ruin the whole effect. So she kept her eyes closed and tried her best to look as dead as possible. Footsteps came into the room. Steps muffled by the rug on which she lay. They stopped by her. She waited, concentrated on controlling her breathing. Then something, a shoe probably, poked her in the hip. She stifled a grunt and did not move and waited for the hallelujahs and dancing to begin. But instead, the footsteps moved away. She heard a drawer opening in the bureau where she kept her purse. What was Fred doing? Risking being revealed as alive, she opened her eyes and lifted her head to see a strange man digging through her purse. It wasn't Fred. What had gone wrong? Flora sat up and cried, What are you doing in my house? The intruder, the intruder jumped up in surprise. He turned and stared at her, and with her purse, in which she kept a pistol, and yes, she had a concealed carry permit, he came up and struck her on the head, knocked her out, and ran from the room. She fell back down flat on the floor. When Fred came in shortly afterward and found her lying there amid, amid the beans, legs askew, toes pointing outward, and thinking she was dead, he began dancing. No hallelujahs, as she had imagined, just an awkward, graceless dance. <laughs> Then after Daddy returned home, things got worse. We don't know what happened to him. It's like his personality changed. He was always yelling at Jerry and me. Of course, I had to be the strong one because Mom was such a mess with all that she had been through with her dad. You know, she is always flitting around, waiting on people, asking them, 
Are you hungry? Can I get you something? No thanks, Mom. I can make me something later. Okay, Pat, you're getting off track again. Oh, yeah, right. Okay, so where was I? Oh, yeah. What went wrong? So, anyway, I had to go to the store and get some things. So I was riding my bike really fast down that steep hill on 14th Street, and this big dog starts chasing me and scared me so bad. And then a rabbit jumped in front of me. I hit it, and it made me wreck. Rabbits are scared of dogs too, you know. That's why it ran. It was trying to get away from the dog too. It was such a cute little rabbit, little wascally rabbit, made me wreck. If it wouldn't have been for that stupid rabbit, everything would have been fine. Uh, Pat, focus. Well, anyway, the dog picked up the rabbit and ran off into the woods. Whew, what a relief, right? So I got back on my bike and came home. I went to the bathroom and started bandaging my cuts. But before I could wipe up my blood that dripped on the tile between the front door and the bathroom, Daddy comes in and sees it and starts freaking out. Blood, blood, always more blood. Please, God, no more blood. I'm thinking, oh, no, not again. So I tell him, Daddy, I'll be okay. Don't worry. But he kept on yelling. Sergeant Davis, they're coming over that ridge. Have your men sh aim every machine gun you got right there so we can shoot every one of them. Don't let any escape. Corporal Escobar, get more ammo. Daddy, Daddy, what's wrong? Who are you talking to? He glared at me with fear in his eyes. Then he shoved me real hard and I fell and hit my head on the corner of the coffee table and I, I must have passed out. So apparently Jerry ran next door and got our neighbor lady. And when she ran in and saw all the blood, that's when she called you. Are you going to arrest my daddy again, officer? Uh. Exactly the reason why I love coming to the Riders Guild. I mean, look at the talent that we have here from just one little prompt, the stories that were read this evening. Incredible. All of you guys are, this, this is one of the hardest ones I'll, I'll ever have to vote on, I think, even though it gets better and better every time. Four amazing uh, people with different talents, but uh, to write a story, I mean, these stories could be published, I mean, and, of course. They, and, they, and one may be, right? That's right. <laughs> so, or one will, I should say. Well, I'm glad that you said that, because that's the main reason for us having this competition, is to show you that one line can produce so many different stories, <coughs> and it's awesome. And we did that to, you become a published author that way, and it gets you encouraged and motivated. So that's what we do this for. Okay, those that are voting, number one was Chris Hayes, was, uh, Chris Hayes the time machine. Number two was Melissa, an elf and a unicorn. John Francois, playing dead. <laughs> and Neil, boy on his bike and blood. So those are the four in that order. So place your vote on the paper, fold it, and I'll pick them up. And the winner receives a $15 gift certificate from Barnes & Noble. <coughs> so you are paid worthy of your wages here. So that's why we do the prompt is to make a means of showing you how one line can have so many different stories created, but you have to have the prompt within it. What went wrong? And then, and while the winner we're gets voting, a $15 gift certificate, you yes. might mention. Yeah, but it sounds good. Say it again. With me tonight, the way I'm competing and complaining and repeating, it's good somebody comes up. Yeah. Okay, while they're out there seriously voting, I want to encourage everyone here. When we get up, 
okay, after this competition and each person, share with the rest of us what you're doing. You have five minutes to do that. And because there's so not that much competition tonight, we'll have longer. So we should have it very interesting. That way you'll know new people that's here while we share what we're doing because you may get connected with somebody that's going to inspire you or even send you in the right direction. And so uh, tonight when they, we issue out the winner, normally we take a picture and we keep records of everything. Um, but tonight, no camera. And the lady that usually does this, Jeanette Poole, who's our historian, has been out with a crushed arm that had to be redone, plus she got pneumonia. So she's still in pretty bad shape. Oh. Surgery went fine, but she wasn't moving and she got very sick. Anybody with a uh, smartphone and a camera can take a picture. That's what I'm thinking. So I'm going to get Dana, I think. Well, has a smartphone, mm -hmm. I know how to use it. Because he could send it uh, to her, send, send it to me, or send, then we can send it to her email. Right. She said to send her the email, so I'll corner him when he gets back. So tonight, I know that uh, there's things that I want to share. Normally, I don't say anything, but, but I've learned a lot. So while they're out there, I'm just going to take my time to say what i got to say right now. Hey, guys, any, my producer, cameraman, a long time ago told me in television, anybody can take a, a camera and film, but not everybody can edit. If you don't have a good editor, okay, then your book will suffer. Just like in television, if you don't have a good editor, your, your show doesn't really reach the audience that you want it to reach or doesn't make the impact that you want it to make. With me, I wanted to say tonight, I learned a lot by publishing my books. Anybody can write a book. Anybody can publish a book. But marketing that book and sitting on a shelf here. My books are on the shelf. You know, I'm so excited. But if they're not selling, what can we do? So we ourselves have to be the main focus of telling people about our books that's there, encouraging other authors with their books, networking with each other because anybody can write a book. But to be successful, you got to market it, pay someone to do it, or do it yourself. But don't give up because... You, it's worth every step of the way. So I have a different outlook, and that's what I'll be doing new. Finding ways to push not only your books, but mine too. And the winner is... Would you please stand, Melissa? And would you take a picture for us, please, and send it to my email? <laughs> Historian wants to be able to put it on her phone. This is my stunned face. Yay! <laughs> Um, Let's see. We'll do it this way and that way. <laughs> Can you get her? Yes. Thank you. All Good right. Job. Thank you. Good job. I, 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 and since, Thank you. And our treasurer. It's, it's obvious that we tallied the votes, and again, it, it proved exactly what I said. It was so hard. It was hard. It, it was good. It was close. The votes all the way around. Oh sure. But, but isn't it amazing how each story was completely different? Completely different. Well, as the president of Writers Guild, I've already said what few words I was going to say tonight. And so I am definitely dedicating myself, any effort I can, to find new resources to promote your books. So if you don't tell us about it, we don't know anything about it. So with that said, we're going to go row to row again. Would you like to share anything that you're working on, or you're working on, or thinking about publishing? Absolutely, thinking about publishing, um, and it's going to be a collection. You want to come up here five minutes? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> it's going to be a collection of poetry, uh, prose, short stories, fiction, and uh, some memoirs, and it's just going to be a. a what do you call it? A compilation. And uh, I'll probably have a lot of pictures in it in black and white. Uh, won't do color because it's too expensive. And uh, the publication I'll, I'll do is probably for all my uh, family and friends. Uh, 
I'm not uh, really interested in shaking the world. Uh, I don't have that ambition in life. Uh, um, uh, you may not know it, even though I'm very talkative, uh, I'm very private with my work, and uh, I don't like to be uh, at a table trying to hawk my books at some uh, author meeting or something other. It's not, not for me. I, I, you know, that's why I don't go to uh, farmers markets and fairs with all my canned goods and the cane syrup that I grind with a mule and cook in a big open kettle. Uh, I'm not going to go sell it. Uh, that's not my ambition in life. Uh, I have a more private life than that, but I enjoy giving away my vegetables and my syrup and, and all kinds of things. So that's my plan. It's, it's not ambitious, but it's my plan. And I want to add something to it because I'm his thorn and his side because of all the awesome things that he's written that he's never competed. And I'm one of those that he probably wishes I would disappear sometimes because I keep saying, you've got to publish some of this. you got to enter competition, but he's right. Not everybody wants to go that route. I don't like going to book signings myself because I, with my material, it's inspirational, it's true, and it's more of the setting where you go for your books if you're going to be successful. With mine, with the topic that I, Supernatural Encounters of the Godly Kind, I'm a church person, I would rather speak it, be a speaker, than be at a table. So I've learned that too. So I respect, I'm still not giving up on you. Because he has some awesome stories anyway. He'll give you a sample. But he's right. So, and you, George, and, and Barbara, you, you only got five minutes. Would you like to come stand up here? What you doing? What's up? What's new with you? This gentleman just published a book. How many of you have heard him speak? This is George Snyder. George can out talk all of us and never stop talking, and he knows what he's saying. He's published a book. So you can say who you are now. I'll be quiet. And his daughter, Barbara, right there, Barbara Ann, she has edited this book for me. Like it's been said, marketing is a big thing, and we're having a problem with that. Uh, we're finding some outlets. Uh, it is now available on the Queen Mary. It's docked in Long Beach, California. Uh, when I was there two or three years ago, Barbara and I were invited for a five-day ceremony. I was a guest of honor, and we did a video and it's been, it's been edited, and uh, what do they call it? It's, it's available, it's on a continuous mm. on, the Queen, Mary. on the Queen Mary, and the book will be alongside the, the tape that people can watch. So maybe we'll get a little, uh, little publicity and maybe sell a few books. They've ordered just a few from us to start with, and hopefully and we're working on getting it in the uh, in the uh, World War II Museum in New Orleans. We're working on that. So I think we'll be able to have some there. I don't know whether we sell some there. But uh, I'm having mostly interviews these days. I was interviewed. That's good. That's good. Well, I, I had I was interviewed yesterday for uh, for one hour by uh, Ed Bo. He did. He yeah. stopped me at a, a, a convention and told me he was going out there to interview you. Yay! Yeah, yeah and uh, I don't know what he's going to do with the tape, but today, this morning, we were interviewed again right. with uh, by Channel 10, and it's for a special news broadcast on the 4th of July. And it'll be aired then a couple of times during the day, I think. So we're getting some publicity, and every time uh, something like that is aired, the subject of the book comes up. So that's awesome. We're getting some publicity. Sure. Well, I want to add to that. Ed Bowie pulled me aside at a uh, um, uh, appreciation uh, dinner for the 
Ed Bowie that wanted to interview you. Yeah. He pulled me aside and he had seen the interview that you had been on my show and then he said that just wasn't enough. He needed to know more. So he told me that he was going to be interview, trying to get an interview with you. That is so rare for him to do that. But when he does that, it's going to be playing and he has contacts to the service and all this kind of stuff. But he was definitely impressed with you as a person and you, Barbara. And, and so I want to thank you for having that interview. But anytime somebody wants to do something for any of you, go through that door. You never know who's going to pick it up. But I'm glad that Ed said he was going to do it. And he does have plans on approaching you about your own show. Because I told him. He said he wants to get behind that. Okay? Yeah. You just have to make your mind up what you want to do about it. And Miss Barbara, you have a lot of talent. Mm, yeah, it's all that, on the shelf. <laughs> it's all on the shelf, you said? So, I've been building a house for 13 years. It's got a lot of shelves. <laughs> yeah, you talk about it. You talk about it. This is Barbara Ann, his daughter, and she has a lot of talent. She's kind of quiet, but when she finally shares something with us, it blows us our mind away. <coughs> okay, with that said. Um, so, yes, I've been dedicated to him and his book for the last two years. Um, all my projects have been put aside. It was a really growing experience being an editor. I had no prior experience, but um, I think I did a pretty good job. Yes. And, uh, let's see, his. Uh, we want to hear something about you. About me? Oh, How about some of the talent you had that you haven't done, like that you showed us a little bit of the. the lost lines, yeah. Something you put aside? And my music, and I compose. Stage plays, novels, short stories, TV series, children's books, eight to twelve year olds, and for the little ones. And oh gee, I've been designing and building a house for 13 years. <laughs> it's a masterpiece. Um, and, unfinished. Um, unfinished. Unfinished, yes, I know, but we're getting there. Um, that's because every square inch has to be a work block. <laughs> How big a home is it? 19,000 square feet. 19,000 square yes. feet? It's a chateau. Yes. My God. Yeah. I need some pictures. Okay. Hey, Barbara. How many? With everything that you just shared mm -hmm. with us, are you? going to be offering any of those services to some of these people in here? Because people are always asking, do you know a script player? Do you know someone who writes scripts? Do you know anyone who can storyboard this and do this? When is that opportunity going to open up that you might consider? For writing? We're talking for others if you can't do it. For example, your knowledge of everything that you do. Could you tell someone where to go to start script writing, or would you want to take a project on yourself. I don't feel unqualified. You don't because you've done it for TV and television and everything else, whatever. <laughs> See how shy she is? Okay. And you've done cartoons. Well. They illustrate or something. What did you I show did, in the video? Yes, I did the line drawings. I did the characters. And the characters. I, I got the um, yeah. uh, digital artist to pop it in the 3D and do the backdrops and everything. Kind of like going on. So right now you're focusing in on your father, but you will resume some of your yes. projects. Um, yeah, maybe. If I get my life back. <laughs> <laughs> when you get your life back, I hope it's soon. No, it, it's been great. Uh, it's really brought me to all kinds of it's places. It's brought out it's brought to you, this place. You have no choice but to talk <laughs> instead of just sit there. There you go. Yay! <coughs> I think he's going to be a house. really asset to this Where's organization. Located? It's uh, by the river, kind of by Ruth's Chris. By Ruth's Chris? Yeah, at the river. river. Yeah. Oh, wow. We didn't know it was going to be 19,000 square feet. Well, I mean, you have to pour a foundation knowing what size it's going to be, don't you? Yes. It's all concrete, steel reinforced concrete. The, it's on pilings that are two and a half feet in diameter, 25 feet in the ground, space five feet apart. Wow. Flooding. 
And it's going to be a lot of weight on top of those filings. You know, yes. we, we calculated it years ago. It's in the millions and millions of pounds. Now, you had lived out of state for a while. You just came back, or you've been here for a while? No, no. I've lived for most reason. of my life here. I lived in England for a couple of years. Okay, that's what it Boston, is. Boston, okay. but almost my whole life. I'm 65, so I've been, you know, most of, a good 60 years plus in Louisiana. Yeah. Holding your age again, and I'll leave that alone because I could not believe you were 65, but that's great. We're glad that's you great. remember. We are, thank, thank you, you and anything you want to share with us, we'll always be you bet. open, you bet. willing to Absolutely. hear. Thank you. Well, I was going to, uh, okay. I think Joyce. Uh, Did she hit Chris? Chris? Hey, Chris? Um, well, I've, um, we can let her read you know, it. I, you know, I have the, um, the, the one book out, and, um, I finished the sequel, and I've been uh, querying agents because I'd like to see whether I could get the sequel and this one, the rights returned to me in November, um, in hardback and with a traditional publisher. So that's what I'm aiming for right now. I've been querying agents in New York because I've been told that since the major science fiction publishers are in New York, it's better to find an agent to sit down with the publisher face to face on a coffee and talk real stuff. So. No bites yet. Um, I've been sending out uh, queries and we'll see how it works. But you know, the manuscript is done. It's the the first step, right? That's right. Uh, it, it probably could use an edit. I don't know. Uh, I'm not an editor, so. Uh, but I, I, I think that um, if an agent is interested enough to take me on, that I can work with them. They have their own editors, too. Yeah. So, at any rate, that's that's what I'm doing right now as far as, as writing. Um, from a uh, personal standpoint, um, I, I work for the university at, um, in student health services, and we're looking at the possibility of being outsourced outside of the university. So, uh, rather than not work for the university anymore, I'm also starting to take some classes in education so that in the event that uh, our department is outsourced, I may be able to get a job as a teacher staying within the Louisiana State Education System. So that's uh, the start uh, my alternate certification uh, in English and Biology secondary ed. Yeah. That also amazes me sometimes of the people that their careers and they're also writing. So it's amazing. Mm -hmm. and I think we'll just go ahead and come back to you, yeah. Chris. Oh, sorry, to, I mean, uh, Joyce. Uh -uh. Oh, yeah. Um, my Joyce has new book. Fourth in the series just came out. I just got it. Proof positive. Um, I started it. Uh, started the series several years ago. Um, it's loosely based on my family, who had a uh, small family newspaper in Texas, and they married in 1928. So that's where my original book started, and they all, uh, all the titles are associated with printing. The um, first book was Paper Dreams because. Uh, the main character had a dream of publishing his own newspaper and then uh, he marries a woman whose name is Hope and uh, She worked in a small newspaper office and that's where they met and uh, So the second book is pressing on with Hope uh, pressing toward the future uh, through uh, a lot of things that they uh, went through the depression and uh, a lot of hardships and uh, then um, the um, Good night. I forgot the third one. <laughs> uh, but anyway, the fourth one is proof positive, and they are the Christian. They're uh, Christian historical novels because I've done a lot of research. Uh, in this one, it starts out uh, at uh, World War II, uh, Pearl Harbor Day, and um, it is a portrayal. I did a lot of research on this one. Portrayal of uh, a family on the home front and uh, in um, all of the things that they went through during World War II, uh, you know, the food stamps and the shortages and um, the loved ones, family going off to war and, and those things. And so that's what it deals with. And so a lot of my uh, information <laughs> is from old newspaper clippings and everything. I have a lot of my dad's uh, columns and editorials and um, just stories that I heard. And so a lot of, m most of the things actually happened now since I was not born until much later. 
Um, I didn't know exactly what led up to the circumstances that I heard about. So that's the part that's fiction, and I like to say that my books are uh, fiction wrapped around fact because I embellish what I think probably would have happened knowing the characters and how they would have reacted. My dad also was a binge drinker, and uh, but they never missed publishing an issue of the paper. It was printed every Wednesday night. Uh, and most of the time my dad had a hangover and uh, maybe my mom had to do most of the printing on the uh, small presses that they had. But um, so I'm excited that the, this book just came out. And I also want to say about the audio, my first book, Paper Dreams, I have uh, put that on audio. And uh, there was, um, his name is Len Bro in um, New Iberia that has a sound studio. And um, it, it, it takes a long time. And Sounds, what's the name of the studio? Uh, Lynn Bro is his name. Now, he, I think he recently moved to Abbeville. Okay. But he has a sound studio, I mean, professional. And um, he, uh, we did about two hours at a time. That's the most that my voice would hold out. Uh, two hours at a time on the audio. And um, uh, it, was just, it was really... Uh, an interesting experience and uh, we have uh, I have a quote or a Bible verse at the end of each chapter and at the end of each chapter a, a, a soft music would play indicating the end of the chapter so uh, but it, it was it was fun it was interesting so who's your publisher uh, it's West Oak Press on this one could you give me that uh, information and send it to me by email at your sure. convenience? Sure, sure. Because uh, we do have a request to try to get a speaker up here. Yes. Kind of tell us what steps to take, and then we'll give other resources yeah, he, as to how yeah. it can be done. Mm -hmm. okay. He does a lot of Christian music and, uh, and things okay. in his studio. Okay. The name, of course, sounds familiar. How many grows about in the world, I know. But did he ever work for a television station? I have no idea. Okay. All right. Okay, and a new member, no, I mean, new visitor, no. Ms. Allen, you have something you want to say? Uh, just an update. Uh, I'm still in the editing process with uh, Christian Faith Publishing out of uh, Pennsylvania. My uh, first book, um, uh, Four Seasons of Love, Grief, and Loss. Um, I have. I did not know you'd lost your husband, so if you want to share with them, that was. was you had met him? Okay. Uh, See, I knew she had this story, but I hadn't, I wouldn't, I was kind of scared to ask you. No. Um, when you lost your husband, I finally asked ac you. Actually, when I went to a part of the process, uh, Grief Share, uh, it's mm -hmm. a local organization. They do it at Asbury Church, whether you've lost a spouse, or a child, or a friend, a parent. You know, they encourage you to go, and it's, um, they do it fall, winter, spring. And it's a, um, I think it's like an eight-week program. You get literature, books. Uh, there's a tape um, that was presented to me by a, a co-worker. Uh, but basically, I was writing before. I did some high school newspaper sports. I'm into sports. I'm into uh, music, and I'm into movies. Okay. So, kind of always had the inkling, but never knew where to take it. So when my husband died, it'll be three years. I had already been working on a short memoir, so I just kind of combined what I had done before and, you know, the process of losing a spouse, the expectation, the fear, the fright, the, the financial the concerns, of life, yeah. you know, the whole, the whole bombardment of stuff. Uh, and I guess I was kind of, and like I said, I've always kind of felt comfortable in the writing world, sports world, movie world. And I'd always used to come to Barnes and Noble, and I've told this, I've told the members this before. I used to always come to Barnes and Noble and see this WGA, and I'm never curious about what was this about. But fast forward, how many decades in? Here I am. Perfect timing. Perfect timing. So you know, there are no coincidences in life. That's right. Um, speaking of editing process, uh, even though Christian Faith Publishing <laughs> has an editor and they have edited it, they send it back to you, and it's weird to see your work down in lines. They bring everything down to a line, and then I have to go back and look at it, see whether it, in content, if what I meant is what I said, and 
then I'll send that off to them, and then the processor will be uh, page design is the next process. So uh, we all learn on that first book, don't we? Definitely, definitely. Because uh, I didn't know this. I was supposed to have done the dedication, the forward, and the acknowledgement, and send that to them. But they agree since this was my first book. Because they would, they consider that a whole new entity, a whole new book. Yeah. So I kind of played the little, I'm sorry, I didn't know, you know. So they were able to let me do that. So I'll be able to, my dedication page, I got someone to do a forward, I got somebody to do a blurb. So, so the and they're book. still looking, they're still looking at the end of, uh, the end of the year. Yeah. That's good. Hey, good for you. you'll be able to share that. So that was what I saw is what they had sent back to you. Yeah, I sent you like the first two chapters. Yeah, yeah. And I thought, I thought it was something you had done. No, they, no, that they, was they put it in that, that order. was that's how they edited. They took the whole manuscript, they laid it out in some software format, and every even the title, Four Seasons of Grief and Loss, that's line three, yeah. and then they go down. Spaced out, spaced out, it's all number. Yeah. And basically, you know, my husband's dead with, you know, was unexpected. We met at work. So I kind of bring all that together. Uh, That's going to be good yeah. for a book to share with other people going through that. Too. And and, uh, and as you were saying on the back burner, your know, work, uh, I'm in the mental health field, but uh, I kind of had a project in my head of this nonprofit. Uh, grief and loss where using hiking and nature's uh, adventures uh, to kind of get a group of adults yeah. and kids together, you know, yeah, to kind of right. There's a lot of that that people go far away to yeah. do. It would be yeah. nice to have something local. So that's kind of like on the back of my back, 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 back. Hey, back. it's coming, it's coming. Hey. <laughs> well, thank you, Miss Ellen. We look forward to hearing more about that. And John, you have something you'd like to share? Sir? Well, there's only two or three people in here. Yeah, we have Dana, Dana, and we have, we have Dana left. After you, and, and we're going to let Neil. Yeah, I meant there's only two or three people who haven't heard my... Your story. My story, but I, I've got several historical fiction novels that I've self-published. And uh, I've always enjoyed writing uh, since I was in high school. History is my background in college, was my major. So I try to set my stories in a historical era where something is happening, something important, something that has lasting effects. So I've got six books that I've written. Uh, probably will not be writing anymore. Uh, I'm doing some short stories. I've done a lot of short stories in the past. I may put like uh, Lewis, are you awake? Yes, sir. <laughs> I'm probably going to have a set of short stories as well. That will be my last hurrah, probably. Uh, I've done, I've written in French, uh, four, five little Cajun French short stories. And I think I brought my, my little book yes. last meeting. Some of you got really? copies of it. Yeah, George did. I enjoyed doing that. I'm hoping to interest the immersion programs here in Lafayette the schools. Perhaps they could use it as a supplemental reading book for their students. I'm working on that. Uh, the Center for International Trade has bought a whole bunch of my books to give out as gifts to people who are coming to visit trade missions or whatever. So that has a little promise in it. But I just enjoy writing. He's also one of our past presidents of the organization and he still comes in to help us. Yeah, I'm hanging on. <laughs> Appreciate it. But that's what I've done and continue to do. I enjoy companionship and groups of writers that I've been with. 
He travels to get his information. He goes all over, then he writes about it. Right? <laughs> yeah, sure. I travel Facts based <laughs> on fiction. You know? mm -hmm. Okay, and this is our new vice president. Yeah, I don't, I don't have anything. You already had, you already had you say so? Yes. Okay. All right. Okay, then that leaves uh, Bill. Leaves your turn. Set up. Go up. Uh, raise it. That should be good. <clears throat> I'm uh, Neil Bertrand. I'm a former past vice president of the Writers Guild. And this month, we, well, I'm an author and a publisher. My son Jeremy uh, helps me. Um, he does the interiors uh, of the books. He lays them out. He does the page formatting. So we have written, well, I, me and Jeremy worked on this one. Uh, and well, we published three books this month and I'll show you. This one is called Fun Times, Puzzle and Activity Book. It has mazes, word search, and more. We have 128 activities for all ages, young and old. And so these are uh, puzzles, activities that we did on the computer. Um, I have different types of, or different styles of mazes. Um, we have what's called word search or word find. We have two kinds of I would call it Japanese uh, math puzzles, like Sudoku and Kokuro. I don't know if you're all familiar with that, but that was a big thing a few years ago. I also have something for those who want to learn how to draw. I have what's called complete the grid drawing. In this grid, you have a completed bunny rabbit. And in this one here, you have several squares that are uh, blank where you have to complete the blank square by looking at the completed square, and that will help in your uh, learning art and that type of thing. And then I have something that I, uh, that I thought of. It's, uh, I call it word creation. How many words can you make from the word whatever, okay? See, like for right here on this page, how many words can you make from the word activity? or the word coloring, or monkey, and so on. Well, as an example, in the, on, uh, the introduction on how to do it, I have how many words can you make from the word bear, B-E-A-R? And you can get, and I, I give them a list of here, you can make B-A-R-E, bra, ear, bar, and so on and so forth. So I have that. Now this, the importance of this for young kids this will help them in vocabulary, not only in learning what the words mean, if they will get a dictionary and look up all these uh, words, uh, they can learn more. Plus, I have the answers in the back of the book. Um, and so, uh, let's see, then in the uh, several of the, the word search, I have uh, their illustrated uh, artwork, so on. Then Jeremy, being a math guy and a computer science major, he did a math puzzle book with three types of math puzzles, Sudoku, uh, Kokuro, and Gokijin. And so he put that together using the computer. And of course, the, the answers are in the back of the book. The third book we did, which was completed last weekend, is anybody Ever, uh, do you remember a lady who had a Cajun restaurant in Scott called Miss Helen's Cajun Restaurant? This is Miss Helen. This was written by her <laughs> granddaughter and um, the granddaughter's husband. So this is called Hey Miss Helen, The Life of Helen the Valcourt Birch. She lived until to be 93, I think, and she had a very interesting life. The uh, author of the book 
um, gave us some color photos. So the book, the interior is in color. Um, and so all of our books, well, this one here makes uh, book number 16 that we have published under the Cypress Cove publishing name. Um, and we plan on publishing more activity books. And so I guess that's about it. Always creating something. Thank you. That's what it's all about. That's your area of publishing. Okay, and we didn't forget about you, Melissa, now. Okay, according to my time, it's 8.18, so we still have plenty for you to read. So I can read quickly, right? Yeah, well, you can read. I know you can read. You're, no, you're on the schedule. Okay. If do do? the audience is for a young kid, you know, picture like my four, like a four-year-old or someone, so I apologize if you're listening to something that's aimed for a picture book. Um, it's called Janie on Her Tippy Toes. Janie what? Janie on Her Tippy Toes. Janie set her dance bag on the smooth, worn bench where her two best friends, Elaine and Marie, were putting on their ballet shoes. Janie zipped her bag open and looked down at two pairs of dance shoes. On her left were the sleek, shiny, pink slippers her mom had bought when dance school had started six weeks before. On her right were scuffed, faded shoes that were slightly too big for her feet. Janie thought a moment and pulled out the faded pair. Why are you wearing those old things? Marie asked. I told you, Janie said, these are my lucky shoes. My cousin Ava wore them when she was my age. She used them in her first tryout for the Nutcracker and got cast as an angel. And now it's our turn to be angels, said Elaine, jumping up from the bench. Don't count your chickens before they hatch, said Marie. We still have to try out first. Come on, said Janie, finding a place at the bar. Let's warm up. Grinning with excitement, the three girls bent their knees into graceful plies. They raised their legs in elegant arabesques. As they stood up on their tippy toes, Janie raised her hands above her head and smiled. I stand so tall in these shoes, she said to herself. At the sound of two brisk claps, Janie, Elaine, and Marie hurried with their classmates toward the center of the room, where the dance teacher was waiting for them. Now, here is the small routine you will do for your tryout today, she said. Yes, Miss Misty, answered all the ballerinas. With their classmates, Janie, Elaine, and Marie followed Miss Misty through each step until they had learned them all by heart. Two groups performed the number before Miss Misty finally called Elaine, Janie, and Marie. Nervous smiles on their lips, the three girls quietly walked to the middle of the floor. The music started, and Janie and her friends bent their knees into plies. They twirled left and right and leaped into the air. Then Janie stepped into an arabesque. At that moment, the strap on her shoe broke, and she slipped and fell. Janie stood up in a hurry just as Elaine and Marie rose up onto their tippy toes. They had already reached the end of the routine. Cheeks warm with embarrassment, all Janie wanted to do was cry and run away. But then a thought came to her. I may not get to be an angel, but I did not practice so hard just to give up. Trying to smile, Janie removed the broken shoe and stepped into an arabesque with her bare foot. Perfect. She did two more turns and finally stood up on her tippy toes, finishing her routine just like Elaine and Marie. So much for my lucky shoes, Janie said to her two friends as she held her ruined slipper. At least you finished the dance, Elaine said, patting Janie's shoulder. As far as Janie was concerned, the rest of her Saturday and all of Sunday were one long cloudy day. When Monday came, Janie found herself once again at dance class. She zipped her bag open and found only the sleek, new, ballet slippers lying inside. With a sigh, she put them on and joined her classmates who were standing around Miss Misty. Holding a piece of paper in her hand, the teacher said, the following students will be our angels. Janie listened quietly. Elaine Lee, Miss Misty read, Marie Manuel, and Janie Reeves. Hooray, Elaine and Jan Marie shouted, giving Janie a big hug. Still, Janie was puzzled. Miss Misty, she asked, why did you choose me? I fell. Miss Misty answered, Janie, when your lucky shoes let you down, you had a choice. You could have cried or even run off the dance floor. But you chose to finish the dance, and that took courage. I am so proud of you, Janie, and I know you will be a beautiful angel. And Janie was. 
I remember reading that. I it. I was like, oh, that's it. I said, okay, that's it. That's it. Okay, well, that concludes what we've, we've done tonight. But remember, next month is going to be a guest speaker, Jack Caldwell. And you're going to read too? You now you're going to read. Come on, I tell you if, what, if you get it wrong me. or get it right. <laughs> Is there anyone else that needs to read? Okay, gotcha. So you are at last. And John, I, I hear better with my eyes closed. <laughs> Apparently. I do that in church, too. Oh. <laughs> oh, really? Come on, Julia, tell us if I, I have a hearing in church. And if I close my eyes, I can hear okay, better. Okay, well, I had part of it right. He's still <laughs> last. Right. It reduces oh, the input. Give a guy a break, will you? <laughs> See this old house? See this old house? Can I see? Keep it. What's the joke? I'm sorry. Put it, put it inside your mind while I read this. Whispers. In this dawn that was wearing its misty rain, from the road it stood with weathered age, a house which was a home in ages gone, clinging within its walls a story locked therein. Window panes hazed with mold and dust, it beckons me to enter that realm of time. On creaking pine floors, much dust-laden made, now inside this house that wants for use, cobwebs cling and dance with the moving air, Spiders stare from corner ceiling hiding places. A patience planned by God's great hand. Dauber nest attached with the wet potter's clay. A dauber wasp buzzes as it earns its pay. The stale air moves about me like a thin veil. I stand motionless, listening, listening. Can I hear soft mumblings? And then again, I hear feet seemingly shuffling across the floor. I turn toward the bedroom shadows. I hear the whispers, but ever so softly, in this house that was a home now alone, a remnant of ages lived where it waits to whisper, to speak faintly to intruders, trapped within the walls, floors, and ceilings. The whispers, whispers, soft, indistinct whispers. Uh, that's one. The next one is called Green Grass Grows. There are things good and others bad, light and heavy, one side or the other. You may look until you find good, but you can never discount evil. I seek tasks that, when chosen, will chip away at the very life of me. But all the while, without mercy, the green grass grows. I can and will do the mundane, for I am caught in the habits that are committed to memory. Like a wasteland, a desert sparse of life. Suddenly a hobby or a chore takes me away from the clock on the wall. Habits flee with the pursuit, all the while the grass laughs at my silliness. It grows plush in the summer sun and rain. I say to my neighbor, how have you been these days? And then listen to his joys or woes before we part. Leaving, I try to find myself. I do so as I sit myself upon the moor and say, and the green grass grows whether I sleep, work, or just sit and read. The determination, persistency, and tenacity of grass is a marvel. It is without my will, with no regard toward me, the green grass grows. <laughs> All righty. Guess what? Lewis, eight twenty-seven. Oh, I have three minutes left? No, you don't. Oh, I have three minutes left? No, you don't. <laughs>
Listen, guys, you never know what we're going to talk about. Sometimes it runs real smooth. Sometimes you got someone like me who gets it all mixed up. But somewhere in the long run, you did read, and you were last. So <laughs> you we like to pick at each other. That's who we are. And uh, just like you, you brought up some stuff tonight. You used one of our newest discovered local editors, mm -hmm. which are hardest to try to help people find what you need local. But it's true. You have to go out of state, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. You know, just like us trying to sell our books. You know, we got to do what we can do. Some places, you know, want to give you the spot, but they want to hide you where nobody's going to see you. So if you're able to get out, even here, mm -hmm. please. I learned my lesson. Don't do a book signing when they're having a big book special, because everybody passes you up and goes and gets those books and comes out the door like this, and you're trying to stop them at your at being the signing right there. So check out their specials before you set up your book signing here to make sure you're not competing with their buy one, get one free, which is what <laughs> happened with me. But we're grateful for Barnes & Noble and what they do for us. So we definitely want to give them credit for everything that they do help us with. But we've got to learn how to promote ourselves. So if you come up with ideas that you think works best for you, please share it with us because there's always going to be some of us looking for a new idea. Um, like I said, I'm going with a different approach to many things um, with me. So I'm going to go for a certain area that maybe you wouldn't be comfortable with, or maybe, you know, like Neil. Then bother Neil to sit at his table and sit all this big old display, and he talks about everything. But me, I'm, you know, I'm not like that. I want to do, I want to, my stories are, I was telling them way before I was actually publishing them. So. I want to go back to the basics, and I want to be a speaker like I was before. So, if you have a story you want to tell, also I'm still taking people to come on the show for the year 2018. So I've written down different things. I got a notice a minute ago. Somebody wanted to set up for August 18th. So I do have, still have the television show, and I will continue. I thought about giving it up, but it's an awesome door to promote my authors here. Like Chris, I haven't had you on there yet. You know what I'm saying? It's not much, but it gets put on, it's free, and it gets put on uh, YouTube, and then it gets shared on Facebook over and over. And anytime you have something going on, if you've been on the show, we put you back up there and say what you're doing, you know, new. So, so if you have something you want to share, uh, be sure to let me know. I'll help spread it or send it to me on Facebook. I'll help you get it out there. So, we need to help each other out. Like you can write it, but you need to also help promote it yourself. So, like I go to a lot of events, and I see a lot of people. I try to so sew into buying something from them if I can. So then again, when they have events, I want to go to their events. You know, they come to mine, or vice versa. So we have to help each other out, and that's what the writer skill is about. So if you got ideas, share them with us and we'll send you to the person that maybe can help you. So as of right now, the meeting is adjourned and we will be having a guest speaker. There will be no prompt competition next month. And uh, but come and listen to what he has to say and network. I think that's gonna be great with uh, Jack.